Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Anaita Mantri from the planning committee of ICS Theatre. As you all might already know that ICS Theatre is getting ready to host its annual ICS Theatre Festival on November 13th of this year. This year, two of the plays we will be presenting are Baby with the Bathwater, written by Christopher Durang and directed by Dr. Farley Richmond. And The Girl Who Touched the Stars, written and directed by Mr. Mahesh Dattani. The interesting thing about these two plays is that they share a common theme. Now, as we all here at ICS Theatre are fervently working towards making this fest a success, we felt it was important to take this opportunity to highlight this topic further as a prelude to our fest with a discussion with the directors and some prominent figures in the industry who might be able to enlighten us and shine a light on this year's place. Our discussion today is about the issue of gendering a baby. Parenting as seen through two upcoming plays produced by ICS Theatre. Let me now introduce you to our moderator for today's session, Arnab Banerjee. Arnab is the Associate Professor of Theatre History, Dramatic Literature and Dramaturgy at Loyola Marymount University in LA. Arnab's essays and reviews have been published in several theatre journals. He has done extensive research on performances by the Indian diaspora, Indian vernacular plays, and contemporary Bengali theater. On behalf of ICS Theater, I would like to extend a warm welcome to you, and I want to thank you for agreeing to moderate this discussion for us. And now, without further ado, let me hand over the reins to our moderator, Arnab Banerjee. Welcome, Arnab. Thank you so much, Anahita. Uh, thank you so much for having me. A uh, big thank you to Barkha and to ICS Theater for organizing this festival and this particular conversation, which is often something that we you know try to gloss over, I suppose. So I'm really glad to be uh, to be talking about this, uh, not only to our August panel, but also to the folks uh, tuning in from from all over. So thank you uh, very much, Anahita, for the very kind and generous introduction, and again for for doing this. Uh, let thank me you. welcome. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, let me welcome our our panelists, our discussants for uh, this. Uh, well, it's morning for me in LA, but it's afternoon for you folks in, in on the East Coast, and it's uh, nighttime for uh, those of us joining the conversation from India. So, uh, for today's conversation, as opposed to this morning's conversation that I was originally going to say, uh, let me welcome Erin Me, Erin B Me. Uh, Mahesh Dattani and uh, Farley Richmond to kindly turn on your uh, cameras and, and join the conversation uh, virtually like we do nowadays uh, in this post-COVID world. Uh, thank you so much for, for being here, everybody. A quick introduction for uh, everyone. Uh, Dr. Erin Mee is the Assistant uh, um, Arts Professor of Undergraduate uh, Drama at the Tisch School of the Arts, uh, New York University. She's also the Artistic Director of Not A Theatre Company and has been an active part of the New York downtown experimental theatre scene for several decades now. Uh, thank you, Erin, for being here. Uh, Mahesh Dattani is easily one of India's uh, most well-known uh, playwrights. He has been writing in the English language for several decades now, uh, and he has been feted with the, uh, with the highest literary recognition in India, the Sahitya Academy Award, for his work, especially in and with English uh, English drama, uh, thank you, Mahesh, for joining us uh, in what is you know fairly late in uh, in India. So thank you for being here. And last but not the least, Dr. Farley Richmond, who is uh, the who is a professor of theater at the University of Georgia, and is the director of the Center for Asian Studies at the University of Georgia, and has been studying and has known India intimately for the last six decades and is uh, part of the reason why I have a career. He was my uh, advisor at the University of Georgia when I was pursuing uh, my doctoral studies under his supervision um, at, uh, at the University of Georgia. Thank you so much, Dr. Richmond, for joining this uh, conversation as well. Um, I want to uh, dive headlong into the conversation without further ado. And uh, I want to start with a question for, uh, for Mahesh. Who's, uh, who's played The Girl Who Touched the Stars, I had the fortune of watching uh, a, a version of it at the South Asian Theatre Festival uh, about, a, about a month ago now. 
Um, in the preface to this play, uh, Tracy Neal, who is the who's one of the producing directors for BBC Radio, talks about how this text of yours is inspired by the life of Kalpana Chawla, the first South Asian woman uh, astronaut as part of the uh, NASA program, uh, the space shuttle program. What was it about uh, Kalpana Chawla's extraordinary life that served as your most significant inspiration? Uh, did the contradiction between Chawla being able to reach the stars while women in India struggled even to gain an equal footing in marriage have something to do with your choosing her life and legacy as your launch pad, Mahesh? Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Arnab. Well, uh, it's always hard to uh, sort of uh, look back and specify where exactly the inspiration came from. Uh, but I think I was approached for a, uh, for a concept uh, for a possible commission from BBC Radio 4 in 2004. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I think the, uh, you, you know, the news of uh, the tragic news of Kalpana's uh, space shuttle Columbia and its uh, sort of um, explosion uh, on its way back to uh, Earth from, um, uh, from its mission in, in the space uh, center was very much in the news and it was obviously very upsetting. But uh, I think the real inspiration came from Kalpana's childhood. Uh, there were so many anecdotes and uh, she was quite a self-assured child. Uh, there were so right. many right. things. Uh, for instance, uh, you, you, you know, um, for a very long time in her childhood, she wasn't named. She was called Montu. And hmm. Montu, as you know, is a boy's name, right? Uh, and I have no idea why she didn't have a name till her school application and the principal asked her for her name. And her mother said, well, we've just been calling her Monto, uh, but we've been thinking of uh, Kalpana or Sunaina or whatever. And then the principal said, so which one will it be? And Kalpana spoke up and said, said I would like to be called Kalpana because it means imagination. So uh, there, there's that and the fact that, uh, you know, Kalpana also had um, a mother who was very, very encouraging of her education and uh, uh, not just her schooling, uh, but uh, Kalpana was very keen to join um, engineering. And at that time in the 70s and early 80s, uh, there wasn't much scope for women in, in engineering and her father was against that. Uh, it was her mother who encouraged her and said that, uh, you know, let's let her do what she wants to do. Uh, and actually, even in the college, uh, she was very keen to do aeronautical engineering. And the counselors in the college dissuaded, tried to dissuade her from doing it, saying that, you have no scope being a woman there, you, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, why don't you think of uh, some other field? Uh, but she was adamant. So I could go on with anecdotes. I mean, these were all the sources of, I mean, my character in The, uh, the Girl Who Touched the Stars is called Bhavna. Uh, Bhavna, as you know, means uh, feelings. Right. Uh, uh, so, it, in, in that sense, I, I mean, although it's not, I mean, the events that happen in The Girl Who Touched the Stars are nowhere uh, uh, connected to right. Kalpana Kaula's real story. Mm -hmm. But still, mm -hmm. uh, very much like what Kalpana said, she said, you know, the path between dreams to reality uh, does exist. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think what is real and what is inspired and what is created, I think there is a path going mm -hmm. through this mm -hmm. process. Right, right. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mahesh, uh, for that. You know, uh, I was, <coughs> I always <coughs> erroneously assumed somehow that Kalpana was, was like Sunita Williams, an Indian American person, as opposed to any, uh, as opposed to being born and raised in India. And then I was looking her up and kind of uh, preparing and thinking about this conversation after watching this, this play. 
And I was like, oh, wait, no, I now I remember. Yeah, she's from Karnal and she came to India and was visiting schools and was going around the country uh, after her first mission. And and I, I remember how much of a shock it was. I was still fairly young and, you know, about to enter college when she when she passed away in 2003. Um, and I remember how much of a shock it was for for the country uh, to process that their daughter, and this is a very South Asian thing to do, kind of you know adopt first push 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 away and then adopt it to be this country's daughter had passed away while aspiring for the stars. So thank you, thank you for that. Thank you for sharing those little anecdotes and nuggets from uh, from Kalpana's extraordinary childhood, just like everything else about her life. Erin, um, I um, I would like to ask you the next question. And uh, my question to you is uh, that you have known the work of Mahesh for, for a long time now and, and, you know, fairly intimately. And you are also a part of the downtown uh, New York theater scene, as I was mentioning, that, that Duran comes out for. Then he, of course, uh, branches out and becomes a phenomenon unto himself. Uh, can you help us connect the dots between Mahesh experimenting with tricky content in India, in, given the Indian context, and Durang experimenting with tricky form in the American context, and then both of them at very different times, but arriving at this crossroad that revolves around parenting or misparenting? Could you could you help us do that a little bit, please, Erin? I hope so. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> um, so first, I I want to, if I could lead into this by uh, saying a couple of things uh, about Mahesh's work, sure. that I think Mahesh is one of India's important feminist playwrights. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, I would say the first playwright who wrote an openly gay character who was not the butt of a homophobic joke, mm -hmm. but was a three-dimensional person. Right. And so Mahesh's writing is incredibly important in yeah. India and, and outside India. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if you remember Mahesh's play Tara, yes. but Tara uh, is also an interesting examination of the way parents treat, uh, you know, their children in terms of gender. And right, if you remember, right. uh, yeah. there were conjoined twins mm -hmm. and... Um, the there was an operation to separate the conjoined right. twins right. and the mother decided to give the leg which was technically taught us to the boy mm -hmm. um and so privileging the boy child over the girl child right right, right. and then right. of course the you know the play deals with the aftermath mm -hmm. plural of that decision mm -hmm. um and so I think uh, Mahesh has been examining, you know, the role of women in India, the, what effect this has on young women. I, I think this is a timely conversation because as you know, the government in India just made a, just a ruling uh, to allow single women uh, to have access to abortions up yeah, until yeah. 20 weeks, right? 20, 23, 24. I've lost yeah. track of the number of weeks, but... Um, so I think there is, uh, um, it, Mahesh has been dedicated to these, to examining these issues of gender and parenting or mm -hmm. gender in relationship to parenting mm -hmm. or the way in which there are still many parents in India who value a boy over a girl, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and this dedication, Mahesh, when did you write Tata? I can't remember. I think it was uh, 1989. Yes, yeah, it was yeah, in, uh, yeah. Yes, it was 89. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a long. You. This is a not just a one-off uh, play examining this issue. This is something mm -hmm. you've been uh, thinking about uh, for many, many years, and. Um, so that's uh, one side of it. And I just really, I do really want to point out that um, Mahesh is a maverick uh, in Indian theater and has been. And I, I think uh, your work, Mahesh, is extraordinarily important um, in terms of the issues that you raise in your work, 
what you ask us to see and pay attention to. I remember there was this great anecdote where somebody came up to you and said, well, I, you know, I have nothing against homosexual characters, but do we have to see them on stage? To which your response yeah. is, well, I have nothing against heterosexual characters, but do we have to see them on stage? <laughs> so again, I think these ways of expanding uh, what is quote unquote normal, which is already a very, right, troubled yeah. concept yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. to, in, to include more and more people who have been marginalized by various societies is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let me start there. Sorry, Arna, by being very oh, long-winded. Oh. I no. think Durang also in New York, I think it's hard to remember now, although perhaps less hard, you know, mm -hmm. in our post-Trump moments than it than right. it was before, um, that it was uh, homosexuality was illegal in the United States for many years, right? Mm -hmm. And cross-dressing was illegal. And so, yeah. for example, uh, Charles Ludlam, who used to perform in Sheridan Square, the theater of the ridiculous, mm -hmm. um, that was for many years a kind of underground, you know, thing. And so Chris Durang grew up as a gay man, right? Mm -hmm. And writing plays in, again, a very homophobic culture. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so he went to a place of taking um, something real and kind of blowing it up to its, um, you know, what, what happens if we take this moment that exists in the real world and take it to its logical extreme? What does that, that look like? And then what happens if we take this moment and take it to its logical extreme? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that people, <clears throat> excuse me, really have an opportunity to see the logical results of the positions that they're taking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and he has many, many short plays in the living room and the right in the, you know, um, where things just go haywire. And again, he is blowing up, so to metaphorically yeah, speaking, yeah, but yeah. you know, the notion of um, the suburban American family with a mother and a father and 2.5 children, right? right. Living happily right. ever after on their couch. Mm -hmm. um, and he's showing us, first of all, how um, empty that model is. And mm -hmm. second of all, how detrimental it is to everyone's mental health. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. so I think he does it in a slightly different way than Mahesh does, right? Mm -hmm. In the sense that one can see in Durang's work, the influence of um, uh, Charles Ludlam, mm -hmm. of drag shows, of the kind of huge absurdity of Everett Quinton, of, right? Um, performance art, things like that in New York City, kind mm -hmm. of combined with an American naturalism. So mm -hmm. he takes the American naturalism and then he just explodes it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so that that normal mm -hmm. makes no sense anymore and is shown to be as toxic as in fact it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mahesh shows the toxicity of normality Right. In a different way, again, by taking something to its sort of logical extreme. What right. if you have two right. conjoined twins and mm -hmm. you actually take a body part that medically would belong to the girl and give it to the boy because you favor right. the boy? And then where are you? Right. Yeah. yeah. Is it helpful? Yes. No, it is very helpful. And I, I think it you know gives us a nice little segue to the to my uh, next question, but to conversation that is to follow. So thank you, uh, Aaron, for laying out that context for us. And yeah, I cannot, uh, I mean, it's it's incredibly fortunate that I get to share space with Mahesh and, and all of you, but with Mahesh, whose work I have known uh, as, as a young theater person in India, you know, just kind of learning about, about plays. And I remember we wanted to do this uh, production of 30 Days in September way back when. That, it never materialized, but it was kind of something that we really cherished and wanted to. And every time I peek into Mahesh's apartment from virtually, I'm reminded of on, on a muggy night in Mumbai. 
uh, just the twinkling lights from the from the windows behind him just reminds me of that of that setting that he had created in a Mumbai high rise. Uh, just can't 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 escape that uh, at all. So th thank you uh, for for laying out that uh, uh, groundwork for us to build upon. Erin, I really appreciate that, Doctor Rishman. I will start with a very basic question for you. I think uh, both Erin and Mahesh could even allege that I am being partial to my advisor. Uh, but I'm, I'm genuinely intrigued. And therefore, I have to ask you this. Why Christopher Durang? Why this particular play by Christopher Durang? Because he, as Erin as was mentioning, such a large uh, uh, corpus of work at this point. And why now? Why in 2022? Why, are we, why, are we, uh, why did you pick up on this play? Uh, because we had a copy of it. <laughs> no, no, to be frank, to be frank, uh, we examined a number of other possibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, when a group of people decide they want to do a play right. uh, and, and somebody has to make the decision, uh, right. you have to cho choose from among the possibilities. And since comedy seemed to have been the desire of uh, those who were talking with me, uh, and so they suggested all sorts of comedies. I uh, was was telling Aaron that I uh, originally thought of doing Medea, Euripides Medea, because I was very intrigued with her, uh, this, this kind of horrifying uh, desire she has to, to get revenge on those who have done her wrong. Right. And, and so... Uh, and basically, uh, when, when one decides a play, one decides a play, I think, often by, in fact, what the, it has to say about the world. But it also does decide that we have to have the actors to play these roles. Right. And do we have the actors in the group of people that we work with right. who we think can or will uh, do the roles that have been uh, outlined in the plays? Right. And so, and so it, it, uh, and then secondly, uh, how difficult will that be under the circumstances in which we now find ourselves uh, so often with very minimal amount of money, uh, only a small, uh, I don't, I don't think our audience probably even knows how, how crippling it is when you only have like 15 minutes for a technical rehearsal for a play that's going to appear before an audience. Mm -hmm. That That is that is uh, for most theater people terribly shocking. Yeah. I, I, today, right now, I'm getting ready to go to do a te tech rehearsal for a play that we have uh, three days uh, to do the tech before we open. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's basically in a circumstance in which I actually will sweep the floor of the theater because no, there's nobody there to do it for us. Mm -hmm. So, so essentially. Uh, one has to decide, are we going to do this or that based on these conditions? Mm -hmm. So it's not just the content of the play and the way it reads to the audience, or the way we think we want it to read to the audience, but it's the circumstances around which we're, we're faced uh, every day with making decisions that, that uh, sometimes we have to make uh, decisions we don't want to make. I wanted to do baby with the bathwater for a long time mm -hmm. because I consider it a comedy and I love comedies and I love to direct comedies. Mm -hmm. I, I have my actor, I had my uh, students read this play recently in the last week mm -hmm. and give me a read on uh, this play compared with several others. And I'll re read the titles, the American dream by Edward Albee, which I was interested in doing mm -hmm. uh, what the Butler saw by Joe Orton. Mm -hmm. uh, which I also find interesting, and the Vietnamization of New Jersey, which was another of the uh, Christopher Durang plays. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And out of all of these plays, uh, I asked the students to tell me, which one would you think, now these are my graduate students, mind you, uh, okay. which one do you think would uh, be appropriate to do in this day and this time? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They chose the American dream. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Almost except one person mm -hmm. said that they wanted to do what the butler saw. Mm -hmm. But why didn't they want to do Baby with the Bathwater? Hmm. Because they were upset with what happens to the child, that, to this point of view that, that they, they felt that it was 
a horrible situation to put a child in. They, they thought of the play as a serious, terribly serious play. Now, I, I don't plan to do a serious play when I direct this play because it's a comedy. Right. And, and so I have to make it so that the audience will want to laugh and want to indulge themselves in that laughter. Even if it seems cruel, mm -hmm. uh, they took what the butler saw as a horrifying play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They addressed it as though it was some sort of terrible play. Well, mm -hmm. so we have to look at what our audiences want, but mm -hmm. which audiences are we talking about? All right. And we're talking in this case about doing this play for a, a mature, mostly a mature audience mm -hmm. of older, mid to older people, mm -hmm. uh, not to uh, kids that are 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, etc. Not that crowd. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the intention. And so, so uh, that's my long answer to your short question. <laughs> about why choose Christopher Durang at this time in this place. I realize that right. there are things about Durang. For example, there are things about what uh, uh, Vietnamization of New Jersey that I would not tackle right. to direct because uh, Durang uh, wanted you to cast a black person, black male to play a white servant mm. in a play. Mm -hmm. And and so and so uh, he's uh, in today's world, we can't do that. We can't do such a thing. We can't do such a play. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to change the gender of the character or the uh, background of the character uh, if we even wanted to start to do it. Mm -hmm. They also objected to the idea of in in, uh, uh, you know, one of the characters uh, pretends that she's Vietnamese. And she does so by taping her eyes with scotch tape. <laughs> okay, this this won't get you anywhere today. No, 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 no. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the point of you know the, the the world the world view has changed, and in in many aspects, I guess, in many respects, positively. So where these things are not accepted anymore, where these things are, you know, which is some of the some of my thoughts as I was as I was reading Baby with the Bathwaters, I was having some of the responses that I suppose your graduate students had, where I was like, ooh, where are we going with this? But then I think I got to see the comedic heart or the comic heart of the work that Christopher Durang was presenting. And I was also trying to judge it from the from giving him the uh, benefit of doubt from a vantage point of 1983, where certain conversations, certain ideas are still in their infancy. People are still working their way through some of these ideas and concepts. And something like this comes in at that point and helps people think as opposed to, you know, um, impose critical judgment on it. So I guess there's, there's, there's things to be said on both sides of that. But for the sake of time, let's move on to my next question for Mahesh. Um, Mahesh, in your play, uh, the Bhavna, uh, the Bhavna is the two characters that we see. Uh, but, but before that, Bhavna's biological sex is concealed initially to prevent infanticide. Um, and you demonstrate beautifully uh, the Bhavna's mother experiencing the trauma of having to conceal her child's sex from her uh, from the child's father, uh, which I can't even imagine. Uh, but the Bhavna's themselves, the two young girls, uh, uh, the protagonists, if you will, of the play, they can only tackle this trauma in the liminal space of afterlife or the subconscious life or the magic real realm, however you want to characterize that. Uh, could you comment on this uh, dramaturgical choice of yours? Was this simply a dramatic device or was there a realization that children, especially in the South Asian context and especially in South Asia, cannot confront their parents about the ways they are raised and often so? Mahesh? Uh, <clears throat> well, if children cannot confront uh, their parents, then I think the theater is the ideal space where they should confront their parents, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a space that the theater offers us. Uh, but mm -hmm. uh, again, for me, it was more the, the, the beauty of, of uh, traversing tra uh, time and space, uh, which uh, I feel uh, was uh, faithful to uh, Kalpana's story as well, uh, mm -hmm. because so many things that she said about uh, 
journeys. And uh, she even said that, you know, over there, we don't belong to Earth. We belong to the solar system. I mean, right. you know, it's just a matter of perspective. It's just a right. matter of location. Right. Uh, and I, that shift in location, uh, 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 I think, uh, creates so many possibilities mm-hmm. of uh, looking down uh, at Earth uh, and one's life with a certain uh, distance. Uh, and I think... Uh, to me, it's more about resolution rather than confrontation because as she is at this moment where she is dying, uh, mm-hmm. you know, is being blown to bits and there's just this right. part of her memory that recalls uh, her childhood self. Mm-hmm. And I think putting something uh, at rest rather than wanting to, re- because it can't be resolved. It, these yeah. are things that yeah. are past yeah. uh, unless you go into some kind of um, magical realism of uh, right. quantum physics or something right. like that. Right. Right. Step aside from time and, and mm-hmm. then sort of change things. Uh, but uh, in, in this uh, situation, I think it was just the, uh, the sheer drama of it, the, 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 the beauty of uh, you, you know, this kind of uh, uh, time past and time present and uh, space past and space present and uh, the sort of vanishing of right. those uh, boundaries right. uh, yeah. so that moment of her of her dying uh, that to me had uh, was dramatically very exciting and that's why I chose that yeah. but having said that sociologically yes Anup, you're absolutely right that there, there aren't enough spaces uh, uh, made available for, uh, uh, for filial sort of candor, uh, the way I see it in uh, American society, mm-hmm. uh, to some extent, at least, again, it could be a very naive ob- observation. I'm right. sure there's so many things that, you know, of course. cannot be about as well. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, I, I think it's uh, that's that's the beauty of theater is that it offers those spaces where you could sit down and you could vicariously confront mm-hmm. your child or your parent uh, through the play because you have the comfort of uh, you know absorbing a story that it's only a story but somewhere mm-hmm. you you are uh, uh, enacting. Uh, scenes from your own life as an audience right. so I, that's, uh, that's uh, what you say the question you ask me I think it's a great tribute to the theater that it's right. possible right no yeah absolutely I, uh, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly Mahesh and you know uh, part of what inspired me to uh, kind of ask you about this is I was as, as I was uh, uh, preparing and learning a little bit about Kalpana's life after again after watching uh, uh, this this uh, play in SATF a month ago um, and I was I was confronted with the idea of this last moments of the astro- uh, astronaut's life as you know as the spacecraft is re-entering and they are discovering that there is this heat shield has given away there is no there, there is no evidence because the flight deck recorder stops recording after uh, seconds after re-entry and we don't know what these people experienced we don't know what their final moments were like we have just found remains but that's about it so it was you know it was almost like you give a beautiful ending to to that and i was i was kind of inspired by that but sorry mahesh you were going to say something yes or not, I, I i just wanted to jump in and say they did I, find what, what happened to Columbia. Right. In fact, it was the heat shield. Yeah. Uh, there was something, the insulation that gave way and uh, there was a gas leakage, yeah. which damaged one of the heat shields and then uh, the, the, uh, the shuttle just couldn't cope with the, uh, with the heat that was generated. Right, that's right. What, explosion. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I have no idea how they, how they uh, could figure that out uh, mm-hmm. because... Mm-hmm. Oh, there was nobody alive who was in there, right. uh, but the marvel of technology that it is possible to figure these things out. Right. And I, right. I thought, uh, yeah, I mean, there's the so much which, uh, which is so, sort of, uh, it was so easy for me to feel inspired by mm-hmm. her life 
me and these little sort of nuggets somehow just came yeah. together yeah. in yeah. Story. Right. No, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And thank you so much again, Mahesh, for that. Erin, uh, uh, moving on to a, a question for you. And and this might be a tricky question. And, uh, you know, I'm asking you this probably because you have been such an experimental performance maker in that in that same scene, especially with Not A Theatre Company, um, your own company. Dramaturgically, help us understand, and you began addressing a little bit of this in the, in the you know, response to the previous question. Uh, help us understand the difference between Durang's world, which is absurdist, and yet is described or often played in an almost naturalist setting, as we see in Devi with the Backwater, and Mahesh's world, which is so firmly rooted in reality, and yet played in an almost dreamlike, otherworldly setting. I'm thinking of Dance Like a Man and the set, the way that the set calls for it, the various levels that the actors traverse, but it's never an actual studio that we see. Uh, be it the formless radio waves in the case of this as in its original iteration as a radio play, or or this production that Mahesh directed, whose setting is often suggestive, but never naturalistic or realistic. There is no space shuttle on stage. Uh, uh, surprise for <laughs> those of you who are going to watch it. But uh, help us understand that. And I know you began addressing it a little bit. This is a difficult question, and I'm not sure that I will do it full justice, but I would say that um, Mahesh's plays, Mahesh, correct me if you, or jump, maybe you should answer this question really. Um, uh, there is a kind of based in realism feeling, but the truth is that Mahesh's characters live in the real world, but the focus of the plays, and now I'm thinking of Dance Like a Man, Muggy Night in Mumbai, Tara 30 Days in September, this play, and maybe all the others. <laughs> yeah, are yeah. in which what is we we go into the fantasy world or you know of the characters right mm -hmm. and so the characters bodies are in the real world but the play takes place in their imagination mm -hmm. and i think that's where the sort of um relationship between reality and i don't want to call it non-reality because i would ask is in fact a, a dream more mm. real than, you know, is what one wants to do with one's life perhaps more real than what one actually does with one's life? I yes, think there right. is, right? Mm. So I think Mahesh opens up the, the notion of realism mm -hmm. to include our fantasy lives, our desires, mm. uh, and I mean that term broadly, but also yeah. narrowly, um, yeah. our dreams, our um, ideas about who we are, who we want to be, who we, right? I mean, you know, the philosopher Martin Buber mm -hmm. used to say that in any conversation between two people, there were also a number of ghosts. So Arnab, in a conversation between mm -hmm. you and I, there is, mm -hmm supposedly you and supposedly me, whoever that is. Right, then there right. is you as you want me to see you, you right. as I do see you, you right. as you see yourself, you mm -hmm. as you don't want me to see you. Mm -hmm. Then there's me as I want you to see me, me as I don't want you to see me, me as I see myself and me as you actually see me. And mm -hmm. so I think what Mahesh does is to say all of those ghosts in any conversation or any life situation are as real, perhaps more real mm -hmm, mm -hmm. than, you know, I mean, again, who is Arnab? Who is Aaron? Aren't we all, I mean, Irving Goffman would say, you know, <laughs> right? We uh, present, we perform a, a self, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think that, I, I think that Mahesh opens up the definition of self and the definition of realism to include these other worlds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Chris Durang, I would say more, Mahesh, I would, I don't, this is a bizarre word. I, it might be gentler. He invites us into these other worlds. I feel okay. as though Chris Durang sort of explodes them or smashes them, right? And mm -hmm. Durang mm -hmm. is also really interested in smashing apart this 1950s suburban white America, mm -hmm. um, and 
in yeah, smashing it into shards. And then you look at this shard and you think, wow, really? Was that right. ever a thing? That's horrible, right? Or was that right. ever a thing? That's right. terrible, right? right? I can't right. believe people had to live in that household, right? So mm -hmm. his realism exists for different purposes right. and in a different way. Right. And I would also argue, I want to tie back, Farley, to some of the things that you were saying about uh, your students' responses to some of this work that you know ludlum had and and i remember this from my childhood you know again all male well no there were many uh, that's not true but in for example i went to see a production of cinderella right and the stepsisters were these hulking football player types you know and things mm -hmm. like that right and then he did a um uh, an adaptation of where he played Camille and he was lying on a chaise and he said, oh, oh can you throw another mm on the fire? I'm not going to say that word, but the word at the time, I mean, it's the word that means a stick that you burn in the fireplace, right. but it also is a homophobic slur. Right. And right. the double entendre there was designed and the entire theater howled with laughter because the audience was gay men mm -hmm. who in their daily lives were living the, the butt of homophobic jokes all the time, right? Who had been called right. this work in, you know, on the street, probably on their way to the theater, you know? Mm -hmm. And so the idea of sort of taking that and exploding it through comedy throwing it back in the face of what is normal, what is right. And sort of, um, and, and reclaiming that particular word in that particular moment mm -hmm. is something that I think Durang sort of mm. latched onto and kind of inherited, right. Or, um, or was influenced by. Right. And so that Durang's a certain aspect of Durang's humor comes from taking the the oppressive thing moment idea parenting style <laughs> etc right, right, right. and exploding it is that helpful yeah no it is very helpful it's very helpful to understand it's, it's kind of it's almost like a, it's, a, it's almost like I'm, I'm in a classroom which i'm really thoroughly enjoying because this is like helping me understand and unravel because i always have these questions about christopher durang in particular uh, who who I I'll admit I don't know as intimately as I probably do Mahesh's plays who I read more uh, in, in, intimately, yeah. But you know, so uh, so it's it's really helpful to kind of process it through that, and it's actually uh, and it is in that vein that I have uh, that my the, which is where my next question for uh, Doctor Richmond is, and it is uh, you know what I really found interesting about this play as I as I read it was the the way that Durang seems to be negotiating with emerging conversations around gender sexuality and intersectional identities, right? He's not shying away from everything, but he is also not pretending to understand it all. I, I really admired that. He's not like, hey, I got it. And he's not making an erroneous assumptions about it, like this, like the way that he is, he was, you know, he was portraying stereotypical portrayals of Asians and Asian Americans, probably in Vietnamization of New Jersey. But uh, could you comment on the historical significance of this text in its 1980s context? So, like, when did you first encounter it, and what what spoke to you about it? Uh, well, yes, '83 is when yes. when the play was uh, right. presented right. and done. Uh, it was uh, when I uh, was on the verge of moving to New York mm. that all that happened, that I came in contact because uh, I had worked for 10 years at Michigan State. And so right. we, we did a lot of different kinds of plays, but not anything along these lines. Occasionally, we'd, we'd for example, Ionesco's Rhinoceros is right. something I directed long ago. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and I've always been interested in in how uh, uh, you could take something that was very ordinary and make it as as Aaron is suggesting is making it sort of blowing it up. For example, the opening of the play of Baby with the Bathwater is right. is uh, the couple cooing and gooing over the child in a bassinet. Right. 
Yeah, yeah. And so that's a very common, ordinary thing that we do. I mean, I, I walked down the street the other day and did the same thing with a little boy that was coming right. along and, and talked to him in a funny way. Right. Because that's right. the way you're sort of, you should talk to kids like that. And, and then they, they go, uh, the explosion is that they go into vegetables. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Suddenly they're addressing the child as though it's a vegetable, it's a potato. Right. It's a pea. <laughs> yeah. and, so, and suddenly uh, the, the, uh, you're taken into a different sort of a, you're surprised as an audience member by that approach. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what he was hoping to do is surprise. He constantly surprises the audience member with behavior that is abnormal and unusual. Right. Uh, the second uh, uh, major scene is, is the nanny appears from out of nowhere. They mm -hmm. haven't called her. They haven't asked for a nanny, but she appears out of nowhere. And I'll save you. Just let nanny handle it all. Right. Okay. And so they they are both these two uh, young parents are quite happy to have a nanny come. And the nanny right. then does bizarre things like sleep with all of them. So mm -hmm. suddenly she's in bed. The three of them are in bed together and, and it, it's out of the ordinary. It's what what happens that they do out of the ordinary that is interesting to watch and experience and and going to the park. And I, I would say that I. I'm not so sure this has to do so much with uh, people in rural uh, areas of the United States, but it's primarily a New York play. Mm -hmm. It takes place because the, this scene in which they're sitting there at the uh, park watching their kids play in the playground looks mm -hmm. to me, it sounds to me very much like I've seen in New York in the various parks right. where parents right. are you know, so, so looking at stuff and then exploding it all. And, and for example, Daisy, who, who we don't meet until the second act, Daisy, the central uh, figure of the play uh, uh -huh. and, and Daisy uh, uh, actually hardly participates until she eventually appears on stage wearing a dress and addressing a, uh, a, a voice coming uh -huh. from the audience, uh -huh. coming from out front. And right. that voice is a psychologist. Mm -hmm. and, and so he makes fun of psychology. He makes fun of education. He makes fun of uh, parenting skills. Uh, he's, he's taking each one of these things and sort of uh, showing you how it could be played around with. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, hopefully that entices the audience to laugh along with him because mm -hmm. I think he's laughing as well. And uh, probably at the reaction of the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I suspect would be surprised to, to hear that people have taken the play as though it was a tragedy or a serious play right. and, uh, and not seen the humor in it. Right. And that's the, that's the problem I see okay. is that if the, if the audience has, has suddenly become so uh, ex, uh, afraid to participate in a human uh, part of human life uh, by laughing, then, then where are we as a country? Right. You see, I, I, I see this actually, his plays as are playing to audiences that could still enjoy this sort of experience. And I'm not so sure that we're doing that with our plays today. Right. Yeah, I think it, it speaks to the uh, a, a social situation, right? I mean, we are so encumbered and we are so kind of bogged down, I suppose, with this kind of constant barrage of one absurd bad news after another, absurd bad news after another one that we, that, you know, I mean, where do we find these humorous openings? Where do we find this little leeways to explore what 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 tickles the funny bone, if you will, to use mm -hmm. the slapstick reference? So I, I I guess that you know you're right. It speaks to it speaks to a certain thing, but yeah, I mean, I but I did also find that very interesting, the way that he was, you know, uh, this conversations that this that um. um Helen and Joey are having over over the child as as unprepared parents that have been you know you know kind of dunked into the deep end of this pool. I find that bit very interesting as well. I mean, I I became a parent. It's been a couple of years. Um, uh, I have a pandemic uh, a daughter, if you will, and and a lot of these conversations kind of resonated with me in those aspects. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, I we we had been preparing for this for uh, for a long time, but I think as as we began the process of parenting, I just there was one moment where Shantika was always ready. It seemed like you know this was something that she had to flick a switch on and she was ready to go. But for me personally, it felt like oh my god, was I ready for this? 
what am I doing? Because suddenly I don't have the time to indulge and sit in front of the computer and binge watch stuff. I have to have a bottle in my hand and a baby in my arms. It was very, very difficult confronting the reality of having to take care of another human being. And what is that human? I mean, it's, you know, it's not like a machine. It's not like something I can control. It's not a task that I have complete control over. It's it's got a brain, <laughs> you know. It was it was a very interesting process. As much as I have enjoyed uh, 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 knowing and learning these little quirks about my child, but so there were things about that that I was that I really enjoyed, that I really appreciated learning and knowing about as well uh, through the, through this play and the way that it was exploring it. Given that it was written before even I was born, so it, it, I found that I found that I found it resonating, and I did laugh out loud at the absurdity of what was being presented in the text as opposed to being like, oh my God, this is such a tragic reality. No, for me, it was like, this is crazy. But yeah, I remember having some of these thoughts. It was, mm-hmm. It's very interesting hearing you talk about that. Uh, again, for the interest of time, Mahesh, uh, uh, my last question uh, for you uh, uh, this this uh, for today, it's been a decade and a half since this play premiered on radio, 2007. And a lot has changed in India and around the world in these years. Erin referenced you know, how the Supreme Court of India guaranteed the right of, of, of abortion and when things have been taken away in the American context. Uh, but And from a place of complete ignorance, it seems that the average Indian today is at least familiar with ideas of gender and identity and the spectrum that is human sexuality. I don't, I don't know, I do, I'm not saying that they understand it all, but they have the vocabulary. They know that these things exist around them. And at the same time, it does feel like we have, you know, also regressed in certain aspects of processing this knowledge. Given this context, what brought you back to this play uh, after 15 years? And and why for a South Asian American audience? Well, uh, again, uh, this this is something Dr. Richman was uh, talking about, is that, you know, there's so many considerations which are so so real and immediate in uh, when you make a choice of a play when you want to uh, 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 you know uh, work with uh, with a group and every group has its dynamics and mm-hmm. true creativity is to work with with those uh, variables mm-hmm. and uh, again you know I I think uh, both uh, you know and I'm sure Erin would also agree with uh, with uh, with me and what Farley said that uh, you know we're we're working with something that's so uh, analog, you know, theater, mm-hmm. and, and that's again the beauty of theater, isn't it? That right. uh, you at uh, something that's very real. It's it's this pencil and this two pencils, sort of how do they sound when they come together? Right. It's right. it's not sort of simulated or anything. And yeah. I, again, you know, I had a similar journey that, uh, you know, I wanted to direct something else, uh, mm-hmm. but then, um, uh, you know, the actors that uh, uh, who had originally auditioned, they couldn't make it because they had other commitments and things. And I think, uh, you know, there's so much to gain working with community theater uh, but uh, there are also these other considerations that, uh, you know, they're not sort of treating theatre as if it's neuroscience. So if somebody's going to die, if you uh, don't uh-huh. do theatre, uh-huh. something you enjoy doing, but at the same time, you have a life elsewhere as well. Mm-hmm. And right. that's wonderful about community theatre. So yeah. ultimately, it came down to, okay, let's look at the uh, uh, actors who are available and let's do uh, uh, on that. And I realized that I had more uh, uh, female uh, uh, actors available to me, which suited me fine because as Erin said, you know, my plays have female protagonists anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, I guess that was uh, one of the primary, uh, mm-hmm. uh, the primary reason why I chose the girl who touched the stars. But yeah. there was also a selfish reason is that I really wanted to, uh, this was the world premiere of the stage uh, adaptation. And I think uh, for me, that was also very challenging uh, because some of my other plays I've directed two or three productions myself and I've seen other directors produce them. So there is this sort of uh, 
baggage that comes with it. Right. Uh, but it was right. wonderful because I was working with uh, something that uh, to me was fairly new uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, yes, I'd written it for radio and it has uh, a, a very detailed soundscape and mm -hmm. how to give it a visual text. Uh, so that was really what was uh, uh, interesting and stimulating to me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no. I mean, I, I, uh, I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, the, the world premiere performance. It was, it was, it was quite something to be gripped into that world and to be taken on that journey. Uh, and and also, but I, but I also, what I really appreciated is, I guess it's the. It's the accident of history, if you will. I mean, it, it fits so well into that context of, you know, addressing an issue, a pressing issue in South Asian American in uh, communities, in terms of parenting, in terms of this hyper-vigilant parenting, in terms of this control that is often exercised on young people and the way that every aspect of their life is governed. And, uh, you know, and, and your play just addresses that in, in, a, in a beautiful way. So you, even though you chose this as, as a piece that you were just wanted, wanting to to work with something new and something fresh and presenting the, uh, that to us it just worked and fits so well into what is becoming a burning co conversation within the community itself so it's just it's always it's always wonderful when things work out that way um and uh sorry I go just ahead. Want to yeah. what you're saying yeah, if, yeah. If I, that, Please. Uh, uh, wonderful that uh, uh, again uh, this this is i'm praising theater more more than anything else is that even an accident in the theater leads to the truth sometimes yeah. Yeah. and i even if Pali and i accidentally chose to do the girl who touched the stars and uh, baby with the bath water there yeah. will be some like what you said that you, you know suddenly we discover uh, uh, you know common ground between these right. two apparently right. very different right. plays right. and yeah. I've discovered uh, the meaning uh, uh, in these plays that might uh, appeal to a, a, a South Asian American uh, audience. Yeah, so yeah. I, I think it's wonderful that by accident we we discover these uh, uh, you know potential sort of uh, realities. Oh, yeah. uh, what we do yeah, yeah. No, absolutely no I couldn't agree more couldn't agree more that's probably the reason why you know I mean I have never been able to leave the theater uh, I think I caught the bug when I was fairly young and I was like this is it uh, I'm not being judged here. This is my space. I love those lights and I want to be here. I just want to be here. Keep me cocooned. Don't let go of me. And theater has been very kind to me, I must say. Uh, Erin, a uh, question for you. And I want to ask, uh, ask you something uh, as a parent. Uh, as a parent, you transcend transcontinental boundaries and sociocultural realms. And I know this because I follow you on social media and I've had conversations with you. Um, uh, and, and so I'm coming at it from from what Mahesh was talking about, what we have been talking about. How did you negotiate the different cultural contexts surrounding the societal expectations of parent, uh, parenting? And how do these two plays speak to those differences? Because they come out of this, you know, two completely different social contexts. Uh, well, so first of all, just for those of you who don't know, my husband is from Kerala. Uh, um, uh, born actually in Kolkata, uh, his father was in the tea industry and then uh, nominally grew up in Kochi, but also went off to boarding school in Ajmer. So, you know, and then I was born and raised in New York City. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> and our daughter turns 22 next week. Um, uh, and I will say, I don't think I've ever spoken to any parent who felt prepared, right? We all feel Good. We oh, good. <laughs> there, you know, until the baby arrives, right? And then we're like, whoops. And as a scholar, uh, I went to, you know, the bookstore and bought every book about yep. <laughs> I'm going to figure out how to do this. And then, of course, my daughter arrived. I was like, okay, well, that's the end of those books. Right. Um, so, right. Um, uh, especially because one of them, it was very interesting. There was one by T. Barry Brazelton and I started reading it and he said, well, I'll be the baby's advocate. And I was like, I'm the baby's advocate. What do you mean you're the baby's advocate? What are you talking about? So, and I, I, as I was listening to you speak and listening to, you know, the, uh, um, nanny who comes, you know, it feels very much more like Mary Poppins, right? This yeah. dysfunctional family, yeah. and then Mary Poppins comes to save them. Of right. course, that ends up in the mother in Mary Poppins. I, 
I sadly let my daughter watch that movie and then I realized how horrible it was in its message because she starts out with a suffragette thing and she's marching for, and of course what she's taught to do is stay at home and take care of the kids. Um, yeah. And that's one of the messages of Mary Poppins. Yeah. Um, which, but, and I, I, th I go back to Chris Durang and absurdity. And I think also Farley, you m mentioned Ionesco. And uh -huh. I remember, you know, that moment in the bald soprano where the doorbell rings and they open the door and no one's there. And then it happens a second time and they open the door and no one's there. And it happens a third time because comedies in threes mm -hmm. and they say, ah, oh, well, obviously when the doorbell rings, it means no one is there. Right. And so, again, these plays also, I think sometimes the absurdity and the comedy lead us to think about assumptions that we make or ways in which we are socialized. Right. And so by exploding that or pointing to it, we begin to think, oh, well, wait a minute. What, you know, uh, what have I been taught or what have I just um, sort of embraced without even realizing it, I, realizing that I was embracing it. And I think comedy is very useful in that way because when you laugh at something and then you realize what you've laughed at, you've been implicated in that laughter, right? Mm -hmm. You don't get to backtrack and say, oh no, I don't, you know, I would never laugh at that. Whoops, yeah. I just did, right? So mm -hmm. I think that comedy is a very powerful way of um, showing us how deeply we're all implicated in some of the uh, gendered uh, assumptions that we make. Anyway, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that to me, as I was reading these plays uh, now, I kept, I mean, so, okay. So Arnab, to go back to your question, how did I negotiate these right. two yeah. cultures? I mean, uh, my parents are very, um, you know, left wing, uh, you know, downtown New York, blah, blah, blah. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, Shankar's parents, uh, or mother, I never met his father. He died before we met. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, she's, I mean, this is a family from Kerala, right? right. So right. first of yeah. all, the women all have PhDs, the, yeah. their teachers, they, right. I mean, so, uh, and there was never any pressure to be a doctor or to be a, right? So that stereotype of uh, the Indian family who wants their child to be an engineer or a doctor didn't, hasn't played out in my um, personal family realm at all. Um, in fact, my daughter brought her boyfriend to meet my mother shortly before my mother died and he's in business and my mother said, a business person in our family, which she was joking. She was doing the riff, right? But that's right, right, the, right. in other words, we have sort of the opposite, you know, wait, you didn't bring a playwright home? What's, right. the, what's going on here? Right. Um, so um, so I, I think that one of the things that I was constantly negotiating when my daughter was growing up in New York is this hyper, hyper competitive, you know, there's ballet on Monday, there's music on Tuesday, there's uh, robotics on Wednesday, there is, you know, um, and on Friday between five and 5.15, the child will have 15 minutes of spontaneity, you know? Uh, <laughs> and so that's the, the, and helicopter parenting is a huge thing. And so I think in these plays, What's interesting about doing these two plays together and doing them at this theater is that these cultures of um, of parenting are put in conversation with each other in what I think is a very, very interesting way. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I actually am looking forward to being in the audience and just kind of watching how people respond to various moments, because to right. me, that's okay. the scientific experiment mm -hmm. of of putting these plays together mm -hmm. um which doesn't answer your question at all but i, I you know 
No, no, no. But it, it, I think it does actually, in a way that you know, I mean, that, so that's that, that's the beauty of it, right? I mean, I think the response to the question is that you did not have truth, and there was this this right. expectations are not real, right? I mean, these right. expectations are false, and I see that uh, with the, with with what is happening as as parents as we are negotiating that in our own realm, right? You know, we you, we try doing things in in quote unquote the American way here, and then my parents and my in laws from India and this video, they come over, you know. What do, you, what do you call those things? FaceTime and WhatsApp video calls. And they're like, you're doing that wrong. This kid needs to be fed this thing. This kid needs to be massaged three times a day. And we're like, oh, well, give us the time. Send us the help. Do us all the stuff. And it's, 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 but, you know, so I guess it, it differs, right? There is not a one size fits all. That's, I guess, well, the idea. You're raising the notion of the extended family too, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Which is, yeah. um, you know, which I, I, my daughter didn't grow up, but she's very close to my family, very close to Shankar's okay. family, but we didn't have people, our parents living with us when she right. was younger, right? right. Yeah. So that is a change from our parents' generation. Of course, um, yeah. and, and that would be true in the US and in India, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, I did give my daughter Ayurvedic massages on a daily mm. basis and things like that. But this American way and Indian way, I, I, what is shocking to me about parenting mm. and the one thing that seems to be true is that no matter what culture in you're, you're in, everyone will yeah. tell you how to do it. And yeah. everyone will tell you that you're doing it wrong. Yep. That is neither you, US nor <laughs> India. It's everywhere in the world i have never seen that not happen i have and, seen yeah sorry go ahead no, finish no, it it's just, so it's the the one thing you know as a parent no matter where you are parenting is that you are doing it wrong right yeah <laughs> I mean, you know, that, that's that's what i love about this conversation and that's what i love about throwing theater people into a room together you take away so many different kinds of lessons i've learned about christopher duran i've learned about new york theater i've learned about why we should appreciate comedy and i've learned about parenting all <laughs> in the space of an hour and a half and i still have one question left uh and erin you're so so right i've met one person so far in this last two years who has said do whatever you're doing Oh, yeah. it's one, right. one person, one. And well, I'm let me talk to them because I'm still, you know. <laughs> right. Um, right. It's, it's, yeah. it's, people get really in your head. You they know, do. They, very, do. they get very yeah. in your head. Yeah, they do. Um, and and I, I there. Well, I won't. Maybe I, that's too much, too personal. But uh, but I would also say that there is a a thing that happens, and I think this is true perhaps of parenting in the US now, which is not unlike parenting in India, which is that these kids who have been overscheduled mm-hmm. and right have not had any downtime or time to imagine or time to dream, right? To take us back to the character uh, in Mahesh's play, that they come to college and they are not as sure about what they want to do because they've been told what to do and they're not as sure. Right. So there's, I think that our parenting styles might need to um, provide a little more room for critical thinking for uh, boredom, which leads to creativity, et cetera. Yeah. So yeah, I'm just gonna, yeah. that's my little. No, that's that's an important it. that's an important thought, and which I kind of blends in nicely with my last question for Dr. Richmond, which you know I was I was recently at a conference in New York, I think it was last week actually, and uh, where we had a discussion in the ways that South Asian parenting, especially in the diaspora, can be overbearing, and I have uh, two questions for you given this context. A, as someone who has intimately known South Asia for six decades now, what about South Asian parenting do you find intriguing? And B, how much of your own experience of being a parent does this play talk to uh, baby with the bathwater? All right, I do have a third mini question for you. Um, and that is, do you see yourself addressing South Asian parenting or the pitfalls thereof by remounting this play for a largely Desi audience? Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> Thanks for giving me that hard question. I started off with the easy one for you. Yeah, so yeah. Come I back got, and I do that. You know, you, know, you know how it goes. Yeah. Um, well, it, it's hard to predict what's going to happen when we start working. 
uh, mm -hmm. with the actors, because when you when you when you choose to do a play and you choose the actors, then then the work starts. Right. And and uh, I have not set any kind of agenda for how it should start. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, uh, I'm trying to keep my mind open because I'm directing something else right now. So mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't want to, you know, clog the drain here and mm -hmm. let it, uh, and rather just wait and come and see what's going on. So, so this, since this, uh, event that we have today is, is in part to encourage people to come and right. see these works. Yeah. I don't want to tell you what I might do mm -hmm. <laughs> just now because I, I really don't know. And, and I think that, I think that um, uh, you may decide to do, a director may decide to do a play, uh, a particular play, but sometimes the direction in which it's done because of the nature of the actors, it goes in a different direction, which is quite okay as far as I'm concerned. Uh, let the play follow its own uh, trajectory and, and not maybe not try to put it into some sort of a, uh, a category. Uh -huh. uh, it it uh, it does, however, seem interesting. In India, experiencing uh, parenting in India was always it, uh, because I lived with a Parsi family, I lived with a Sikh family, and I lived mostly with uh, a uh, Brahmin, uh, uh, Kerala Kum slash um, Madrasi Brahmin. And so, and their family, and they were all very different. And uh, my my first wife uh, is uh, Parsi, mm -hmm. and uh, and I was surprised at how um, how they live such a close quarters. They they live in often in close quarters, uh, not the rich. The rich live lavishly, right? But, of course, but, of course. Yeah, but but uh, I found it very. Um, sometimes uh, like a circus, mm -hmm. the family mm -hmm. events, when you get together, was like a circus. You, you always had events taking place here, there and everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so, and so uh, in terms of, uh, we, I never experienced new children being brought up. Oh, well, I take it back. My niece, who's now uh, teaching theater here in this country, mm -hmm. uh, she, she, uh, was a, a child who, and you know the Taj Mahal in Bombay, yeah. the very ritzy yeah. mm -hmm. hotel, and yeah. that and that uh, she decided to scream when she went, entered the door and never stopped till we left. <laughs> so, so, and everybody tried their best to try to find out what was wrong and why are you crying and what's happening and this went on and on and i thought how can they how can they possibly raise this child she's impossible <laughs> now she's a very gifted director i mm -hmm. must say mm -hmm. she grew into a very sensible teacher and imaginative uh, teacher uh, mm -hmm. working with the poor she often does work in uh village villages mm -hmm. and in slum areas in bombay Mm -hmm. uh, also in Greenpeace, she's involved in Greenpeace. She's very dedicated, you mm -hmm. know. So that that side of things was there, and then the in Kerala, the other side was the sort of restrictiveness in a um, Malayali uh, and uh, Brahmin household uh, mm -hmm. to to what happens with the child. Uh, the most telling thing is my wife was always saying this is that that when after the child was born uh, mm -hmm. next door to us and, and uh, the, the mother brought her, the child over to us and said, would you mind coming with me because I can't go into the kitchen since I have my period mm -hmm. and, and I can't touch anything in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. I none of the vessels, none, I can't cook, but I need something out of the freezer uh, to be done, could you come over and open the freezer door? Right. And so, and so this, this came as a huge, you know, you think to yourself, oh, these are not the rules I wanted my mother to have at home. Mm -hmm. you no, know, this is, this is a very different world. Mm -hmm. And so, so the one thing about India that I think is striking and I, and, and wonderful is that it's so different. One, place to the other right. and right. one family to another yeah. there's yeah. so many different uh, aspects i was delighted to hear uh, mm -hmm. uh, hear the uh, description of uh, of the households and that i thought to myself uh 
well, this is what makes India so exciting as a country. Right. Yeah. yeah. And therefore the, the creation of drama and theater in India is extraordinarily uh, wonderful to be involved in. Right. And quite an adventure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so all of you who are, who are uh, my j grandchildren uh, uh, in, in terms of age, uh, you know, I, I give it to you that you, you carry the banner forward for how direct, what direction it's going to go in, in uh, the near future. And uh, I wish you all the best. Right. Yeah, no, I think that's, uh, that, that's, that's, that's very, that's very interesting. Yeah. It would be really exciting to see the direction that this play takes under, under your, uh, under your uh, leadership as the, as the cast uh, tries to negotiate it and how it converses with what uh, Mahesh has already uh, created with the girl who uh, reached the stars. Uh, it would be really wonderful and interesting to, uh, to, to see that uh, take shape. Um, I was uh, talking to Anahita and I was wondering if there were questions from audience members, but we have had a couple of observations and what no questions thus far, uh, thus far uh, yet. Um, uh, Umesh have, has commented on our uh, on our YouTube live stream uh, about you know about a reality that I think a lot of creative people are confronting right now is uh, is about can can a can a writer or can anyone create anything that does not offend someone. Uh, in this day and age, I think it's it's you know I think that's that's a that's a good observation. I think we all end up uh, being offended with something, and I find you know as 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 I'm sure all of us are keenly aware of, it's probably the result of having a uh, having a bullhorn given to you, your Twitter or your Instagram or what have you, whatever social media you're on. You can immediately vent your frustration and your and your being offended in a way that you think is very nuanced, which often it is not. Uh, it's just a momentary uh, reaction, if you will, uh, and and that that that's why you can vent it, and therefore you know we hear more about the about everyone getting offended with every little thing, because everyone has that uh, pedestal, and everyone and people are trying to you know blow everything up and make it into a vital phenomenon, what have you. It's best it's just be people making money off of uh, the backs of art and artists. It's uh, it's always happened and it always will be, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, Raja Raja Dotto uh, writes, uh, well, it might be uh, fair to add that Mahesh sir's plays tend to make the coexistence of the real and the imaginary or what is actual versus what is desired quite inevitable. Uh, his take on the characters and themes are very organic to the context of his plays, probably because desires and imaginations are also a part of the very real. They originate from someone and from something that's very real. Oh, uh, and I, I, I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree anymore with you. I think that's a very beautiful way of summarizing what uh, uh, what Mahesh's plays uh, uh, do and what the, the the role that they have. And which is why you know I mean, there is this, such a vast audience and such so is people understand the plays. I mean I teach this. Play Place to a bunch of South Asia uh, to a bunch of American undergraduate students in a summer class uh, in uh, in Los Angeles, where everyone's there to become the next Hollywood big thing, um, and it resonates with them. It you know it's it's something that they can understand. It's something that they can process. It's something that they try to negotiate with, and I think it's because of this the, the way that Mahesh you know plays on the imaginary plays on the unreal while keeping it grounded, while keeping it like 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 I was saying with on a muggy night in Mumbai again because he is where he is seated right now. Um, it is a party happening in an apartment in a Bombay high rise. There's an actual wedding happening outside. Yet the conversations, yet the events inside are you know there is this extra real quality to it. There is this mugginess of Mumbai and the society encroaching upon the characters' lives as they try to figure out a way out of it. The claustrophobia is very real and very real almost uh, unreal simultaneously and that's the beauty of it um so thank you so much again for sharing all of those works um we have overshot our time so unless there is a little bit of a concluding thought from any of you i'm going to bring this conversation to a close thank you to all of those people who joined us on youtube and for being here and um and you know it's, it's really exciting that this festival is happening i'm so glad aaron you get to go and uh, and watch this place live it's going to be really wonderful it's very exciting to be in uh, the east coast 
Um, I don't think I'll be able to be in the audience uh, live this time, uh, but I have at least I have seen Mahesh's work and I look forward to connecting with all of you. And thank you so much for sharing part of your Sunday uh, evening, morning, afternoon with all of us uh, in this virtual platform. Thank you very much. And I will see you soon. Well, before thank we wrap this discussion up, I would like to thank you, Arnab, uh, thank for you. moderating today's session. And thank you to all of our guests, Erin, yeah. uh, Mahesh, Dr. Richmond, for this exceptionally enlightening conversation. And as Arnab mentioned earlier, it was like being in a theater classroom with all these knowledgeable <laughs> and wonderful teachers. It was so exciting. So thank you all again. And I would like to take this opportunity to remind everyone again, our viewers, that uh, the ICS Theatre Fest will be showcasing these two plays, Baby with the Bath Water and The Girl Who Touched the Stars. The fest will be held on November 13th at New Brunswick Back Theatre in New Jersey. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.